In this video, we're going to have a look at geometric sequences. Now, many of you may have dealt with them already in grade 11, and you called them exponential patterns back then, but it's going to be the exact same idea that we dealt with in the previous video. We're going to look at how these sequences form or how they progress getting from one term to the next. And then we'll also look at the general term and how we can work out the different parts of these sequences using the formulas that we're given. So going on then from that word progress, we want to remember that for an arithmetic sequence, the way that we got from one term to the next was because of that constant difference between each of the terms. And if you look here at this pattern, you'll see that from three to six, we're adding three, from six to nine, we're adding three again, from nine to 12, it's the same process. So from one term to the next, we're adding on a value. Whereas if you look at the pattern below, you'll see that to get from one term to the next, from the three to the six, and then the six to the 12, we're no longer adding a value on. We're in fact multiplying by two every time. And so from 12 to 24, we're multiplying by two again. And that basically summarizes exactly what a geometric sequence is. It's a sequence where instead of adding a number, we're now going and multiplying a number on to get from one term to the next. And that number that we multiply, we call that the ratio. So if you look over to the side of your page here, as normal, we would always start a sequence with the first term A. And that means that to get to the second term of the sequence, we would need to multiply by that ratio, which we call R meaning the second term would become AR. And again, we will multiply by R again to get to the third term. And that would then become AR squared because R times R becomes R squared. And then to get to the fourth term, we multiply by R again, and it now becomes AR cubed. And just like we saw when we were dealing with the arithmetic sequence. That is where n is one, where n is two, where n is three, and where n is four. And basically you see that the number of ratios is always one less than the term that we're in. So it's always going to be n minus one basically because it's one smaller. So to get to the general term then, down in this block, we can see the TN is going to be A R to the N minus one. And that's the general term that we'll be working with throughout this section. A little bit more information though, on that R value, it can actually be defined as TN divided by TN minus one. So that's basically saying, just like we did with the arithmetic sequences, that we've got n and n minus 1. And that means we're going to take the term in the higher position and divide it by the term in the lower position. So something like t2 divided by t1, where t2 is the higher position because it's term 2, and t1 is the lower position because it's term 1. So if we had t100... That would be over n minus 1, one term lower, 99. If we had t50, that would be over t49. So it's always divide the one in the higher position by the one in the lower position. So we've got our general term over here, where we know that a always corresponds to your first term, where r is your ratio or the number that you're multiplying to get from one term to the next your n value is your position and tn is obviously your general term or you can think about it as the value in that position so if i gave you something like t10 it means what number is in the 10th position of the sequence. So it's basically the actual number 
in the sequence itself. So now that we've got the theory out the way, let's go and have a look at an example. So this is the first example we'll look at. It says, given the sequence 8, 4, 2, 1, determine the nth term of the sequence. Now we know that when it's asking us to find the nth term, we basically want to figure out what Tn is. But before we can do that, we've got to ask, what kind of sequence are we dealing with? Now, obviously, in this case, you know it's going to be geometric because that's the video we're doing. But you still need to prove it to yourself in tests or exams. And the way that you can do that is just go over to the side of your page and you can do it in pencil or whatever you want. But just make sure that it is a geometric pattern. So we can see there we've got 8, 4, 2, 1. And if we go and take T2 divided by T1, that's going to be 4 divided by 8, which is a half. And if we go T3 divided by T2, which is term 3 divided by term 2, that is 2 over 4, which is a half. When these numbers begin matching up there and there, we know that we've got a geometric pattern because it's got a constant ratio. In other words, to get from one term to the next, we know we are multiplying by a constant value of a half. Now that we've got that sorted out, we can go and find our Tn value. So we know that for these sequences, Tn is equal to AR to the power of n minus 1. And when we're finding the nth term, we only plug values into A and R. We leave the n in the sequence because we want a formula to basically find out any term at any position. So the A value is 8, put it in a bracket. The R value is a half. And there's our n minus 1. And so basically that whole idea of Tn is equal to 8 times a half to the power of n minus 1, keeping everything in a bracket, gives you your answer. Some people, though, are very tempted to multiply the 8 and the half together and say it's equal to 4 to the power of n minus 1. Make sure you don't do that, because that half has an exponent on it. And because of that, algebraically, we can't multiply those two numbers together. Just like if we had something like 2 to the power of x times 4 to the power of x, we wouldn't go and multiply those two numbers together and say it's 8 to the power of x. It's the same principle here. We've got to keep those two bases separate from each other. So there's your answer. Tn is 8 times a half to the power of n minus 1. The next question then says determine the value of the 17th term. So it's basically saying to you which term is going to be in position 17. And because we're talking position, we're saying n is equal to 17. So that means we're going to say that t17 is equal to 8 times a half. And then we sub in 17 for n. So it's going to be 17 minus 1. And you can just take out your calculator to work that out. So if we take that out, it's going to be 8. Keep your brackets. There's a half to the power of 17 minus 1. And that's going to give us 1 over 8192. So that equals 1 over 8192. And that is the 17th term of the pattern. The last question then asks us to find which term is equal to 1 over 2048. So here we're no longer speaking about what term is at position, whatever it might be. Instead, it's saying to us that that there is the actual value in the sequence. So we can basically think if our sequence went 8, 4, 2, and so on, eventually we would get to the number 1 over 2, 0, 4, 8. So we know that that is then going to be the Tn 
because that's the value in the sequence itself. So it'll be 1 over 2048 is equal to 8, a half to the power of n minus 1. And just like any equation, we're solving for n here. So to firstly get n by itself, we're going to need to isolate that entire piece. So that would mean we need to go and take the 8 in front over to that left-hand side. So when we do that, we get 1 over 16,384 is equal to a half to the power of n minus 1. Now, the way that we're going to have to solve this is in fact using a log. You might have already dealt with logs in grade 12 already, but for those of you who haven't, here's just a quick summary of what a log actually is. So in grade 11, if I gave you a question, 2 to the power of x equals 32, like so, you would probably go and say, well, 32 is 2 to the power of 5, therefore x is equal to 5. Because when we get the same base, we can go and drop the exponent. Now, it works the same way with a log. Basically, what you've got to understand is that in a log, the exponent, which is over there, will now become the subject. And the part that is attached to the exponent, which in this case is a half, that is called the base. And for a logarithm, the base stays the base. So rewriting this, we would make the exponent the subject. Then we would write log. And the smaller number at the bottom of the log, that is your base. So in this case, the number that we'll write there is a half. And whatever's left over then, we can simply write next to the log like so. And so if you take out your calculator, it's going to be the log in the top corner there. The base of that log is a half because the base stays the base. And then it's going to be 1 over 16,384, which gives us 14. So in other words, that n minus 1 is equal to 14. And bringing the 1 over, we get n is 15. So we no longer have to use this over here where we make the bases the same. Instead, we can always use a log because it will simply make the exponent the subject and we can go about solving the rest of the question. Let's look at one more example then that's going to combine both arithmetic and geometric sequences. In this example, we're going to need to use a little bit of problem solving. So it says here, given the following sequence, 6, x, y, 16, where the first three terms form an arithmetic sequence, meaning they're going to have a constant first difference, and the last three terms form a geometric sequence, meaning now we're going to have to use that idea of a constant ratio. And it says determine x and y. So looking at that then, the first three terms there, that forms your arithmetic sequence. And the last three terms, that forms our geometric sequence. So if we want to write that below, we can say that for our arithmetic sequence, it's going to be 6xy. And for our geometric sequence, x y 16. Now because of how we know that this over here is an arithmetic sequence, we could perhaps go and put together that x minus 6 is equal to y minus x. Because we know that the differences have to be constant. So in other words, t2 minus t1 has to equal t3 minus t2. And likewise then, for the geometric sequence, we know that y over x 
is going to equal 16 over y. Because using that idea of the constant ratio, we know that t2 over t1 has to equal t3 over t2. And basically that gives us two equations that we can solve simultaneously. So if we go and do that from equation two, and we'll go up to the side over here, from equation two, we can rewrite that, that x is equal to y squared over 16. And then we can go and sub this second equation into our first equation. And so we basically get that y squared over 16 minus 6 is equal to y minus y squared over 16. Because we've gone and subbed in wherever we see an x, we replace it with that y squared over 16. And then it becomes a case of just solving it algebraically. So we can group up those two like terms there and there. And when we do that, we're going to get y squared over 8 minus 6 equals y. Bringing up that denominator means we're going to have y squared minus 8y minus 48 equals 0. And that over there is a quadratic equation. And you can factorize that or solve it using the quadratic formula. But when you do that, you're going to get y minus 12, y plus 4 equals 0. So therefore, y is 12, or y is negative 4. Now all we have to do is go and figure out what those x values are. So if we want to go get the x values then we can just go and sub those values into this equation here. So for when y is equal to 12 we're going to have 12 squared over 16 which gives us 9 or when y is that negative 4 over 16 we get 1. And that is how we work out the values for x and y in this sequence. It could either be 12 and negative 4, or it can be 9 and 1 for x.